or we know when to start. Okay. We can start now. Great, thank you. So thanks Ashok and Neeraj for organizing this and uh, welcome everyone to the eighth webinar of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, POSI. Uh, I'm Alaric Arujas, and I'm the Vice President of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. And today we have two very eminent speakers who are going to share their experience and their expertise on a topic which is dear to all of us, and that is developmental dysplasia of the hip. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of issues and controversies regarding the diagnosis and management of this condition. And it's something that we as pediatric orthopedic surgeons and even some general orthopedists who deal with it on uh, an occasional basis. And because the topic is so vast, we have decided to restrict ourselves to just the uh, age group from birth up to three years of age. So we will not be discussing about the older patients, nor will we be going into the management of adolescent and adult hip dysplasia. Uh, to introduce our two speakers, uh, we have two very eminent hip surgeons with us today. Uh, the first, of course, is our good friend, Dr. Kishore Mulpuri. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of British Columbia and an attending surgeon at the BC Children's Hospital at Vancouver, Canada. He is the director of the International Hip Dysplasia Registry and a very close friend of POSI. Uh, he's been to several of our meetings. He has mentored a lot of us. Um, he is extremely high on collaborative work, not only with us in India, but with several centers from around the world. And he's one of the foremost experts when it comes to DDH. So we're really glad to have him on board today. Welcome, Kishore. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Woodbuff Shankar. Woodbub is an associate professor at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, US. Uh, he is also an attending uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And his interests uh, are across the entire range of pediatric hip conditions, right from DDH to herpes to slip capital epiphysis to FAI and management of uh, adult hip dysplasia as well. So what we'll do today is to have uh, two talks, the first by Kishore Mulpuri on the early screening and management of, of DDH. And then Woodbub will take us through the little older child up to the age of three. After this, we have a very interesting interactive case discussion session. And I know a lot of questions will come out at that time. So I would suggest that all of you who have questions in the audience should hold on, note your questions down, you can certainly ask them during the talks, but they will all be answered towards the end during the interactive discussion session. And at that time, we'll bring on board our panelists as well. And I would introduce our, our two panelists today, Dr. Ramni Narsimhan, who's the uh, past president of POSI, and Dr. Vijay Sriram from Chennai, who is a, 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 another hip surgeon and has a lot of expertise when it comes to DDH. On our panel today, we also have Dr. Dhiran Ganjwala, who's the president of POSI to share his experience and expertise as well. And Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, who is the secretary of POSI. So without much ado, I will hand over the mic to Kishore. Kishore, you can start sharing your screen and take us through that initial presentation of DDH and what we need to know in that young child who comes to us with DDH up to the age of six months. Can you see my eye screen? Uh, okay. Not yet. We can see the screen. Dr. Kishore wants to share the screen? Yes. Hi, we can see your screen. Don't minimize it. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Let's start the slideshow. Okay, awesome. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, it's very clear. You can go ahead. 
Good morning, everyone. And uh, as Al talked about, I have a long association with uh, with Posey, and I was there at the first meeting of Posey in nineteen. I guess at the pre-first meeting, which happened in Vancouver, and then followed by the meeting in Mumbai. So it's a real privilege uh, to be here. And uh, po attending Posey meeting is one, of, I would say, one of the highlights of my academic travels and social travels, dare I say, because I've got quite a few friends and catching up with them. And as far as I can, and when this thing slows down and count me in and Goa and any other meeting that's going to come in the next few years, and I'll be there. It's also a real pleasure. Um, the panelists are uh, close friends and uh, also indeed an honor actually to be presenting with Woody Shankar. Woody has been a very active member in the pediatric hip circles and uh, is a, one of the co-directors of International Dysplasia Institute, which is the body that really started all of this moment of trying to work collaboratively together for a prospective study. Now on the executive of International Dysplasia Registry, and you would see throughout my presentation, several papers have his name attached to them. So it's a real honor actually to be co-presenting with him. So without further ado, I will uh, go into the topic. So these are some of the mentors that have heavily influenced who I am today. And you will also see as much uh, I try to present first what I do and try to give some evidence background and sort of my preferred technique, but who I am today and what I do for my clinical practice, where there is not a strong evidence, where there's ambiguity or where the art of orthopedics, which we all do differently from the science, is heavily in influenced by these mentors from different parts of the world who I've had a great pleasure of working very closely with over the years. And as far as DDH is concerned, most notably, Dr. Chad Price, who actually started the IHDI, and I owe a lot of gratitude to him. And I also like to acknowledge the funding for most of our hips that comes from this organization called I'm a Hippie. So in my talk, I'd briefly like to outline about terminology and the spectrum of DDH that we see, screening and diagnosis of development dysplasia of the hip, in 2020, what should we be doing around the world and in India? And I will talk about the brace management. And after that, Dr. Shankar will talk about the close reduction and the treatment and management of the older child. So I'm not going to go into the definition of DDH with you all, which you all know it's a spectrum of dysplasia of the hip. And it the variable incidence, depending on what you're looking at, and also the incidence in terms of subluxations and dislocations are different based on what kind of screening practices we use. And that's why there's wide variability in terms of subluxations and dysplasia that's reported around the world. Places that have universal ultrasound screening program obviously diagnose way more. I'd like to introduce this uh, spectrum to you if you're not familiar with it. The reason that we started using this in IHDI, now IHDR studies, is that our literature is filled with terms like otolani positive, bottle positive, uh, dysplasia of the hip, not really specifying the spectrum that we're dealing with. Are we dealing with a dislocated reducible hip? Are we just dealing with just a mild dysplasia? When you call bilateral DDH, are you talking about two mild dysplastic hips? Are you talking about one side, a mild dysplasia, and another side, a dislocated reducible hip? Because the management and outcomes are very different. So it's really important when you're trying to publish, when you're trying to communicate with someone, when you're presenting a paper, when you're looking at your own outcomes, really have to think about where in this spectrum that particular hip belongs, if it's unilateral or bilateral. And moving on to screening, and as some of you will identify when you get hips that are three, four, five years of age, because in India, we don't even have a universal clinical screening. If we have a good universal clinical screening, clinical screening that happens at well baby checks, we won't be dealing with the number of hips that we deal with. And so we probably don't have any kind of an organized screening method 
There are some countries where clinical screening is a must. Every single child is screened and documented in the chart that this child is screened for hip dysplasia. And in some countries where there is a universal ultrasound screening, which is very, very expensive, a lot of false positive. And some, I've not mentioned that here, I have actually a universal x-ray screening program. For example, in Chile, every single child needs to have an x-ray by the time they're between six months to a year of age. And there are a lot of other countries, including ours in Canada and our own province, we do high-risk screening. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail how to examine a baby hip, which you're all very familiar with, and that's, I think, taught really well to us for orthopedic surgeons in India. And the Bartlow and Ortolani maneuvers, again, the same thing that uh, quite routinely used for people that know how to do these tests. Moving on to ultrasound exam, there are two methods that frequently used. One is a hard key method, which is out of Wilmington, Delaware. And that really is a dynamic hip exam. And it's difficult to reproduce in terms of what is the quantity and quality of the pressure that you use to have that hip go in and out. So it is quite popular in some centers around the world, but universally, the ultrasound measures that we use are popularized by graph from Austria, which typically takes into account your alpha angle, your beta angle, and your percentage from overhead coverage. And we start to think about if we see less than 50% from overhead coverage, and we start to worry about where this hip is at, but not frankly dislocated, but you start thinking about it. And I'll come to graph classification in a second. So if you look at this very complex uh, diagram or a table, the graph one is virtually a normal hip and a graph two A and two B is mildly dysplastic. You have an alpha angle between 50 to 59. There is actually a measurement error of about five to eight degrees, depending on who measures that ultrasound. So there are some that would treat these two A's and two B's. And as you move on from 2B and 2C and into type D and into three and four, you're moving on to the more severe end of the spectrum of the dysplasia of the hip. Personally for me, again, this is another picture that can show you about the type one and two, what they look like probably in a schematic picture. And as you can clearly see in the three and the four, three where the labrum is pressed upwards and four where the labrum is pressed downwards are the ones personally that I would treat. And I would not treat a 2A and 2B personally. And uh, that's just my preference, but I do understand and accept there are a lot of surgeons that treat them around the world. And that is actually one of the topic of investigations as a part of a registry. When do we do ultrasound? If you're looking for dislocation, do an ultrasound whenever you want. But if you're really looking for dysplasia, that means your clinical exam, you're pretty sure the hip is in, but you're not so sure based on the family history or some of the features, you really wanna understand what the hip looks like. And then you should really do that ultrasound between six to eight weeks of age. This study done out of Adelaide, Australia during the time I was a fellow by my co-fellow from Sweden took the normal hip exams, no risk factor babies, and did ultrasounds at two weeks and at four weeks and at six weeks. And they saw a trend towards a normalization of the hip roughly between four to six weeks. So really that's the time you wanna wait to look for dysplasia. Anything before that, you end up getting a lot of false positive, hence the universal screening programs where they do ultrasounds between two and four weeks reading a lot of those hips. When we looked at the systematic review of reproducibility of some of these metrics, it's really all over the map. There's a huge range and variability between what's considered normal and what's considered abnormal. But then there is also a measurement error between different studies. Uh, as you can see, there's a huge wide variability of inter and intra-exam reliability. So even though we use these metrics now, 
we do need some better ways to quantify dysplasia as we move forward. And this study done by International Dysplasia Institute led by Woody Shankar really looked at what is the correlation of a fully dislocated hip with alpha angle, beta angle and percentage from late coverage. They found if you take a cutoff about between 30 to 35 percent, you would end up probably covering 90 percent of the hips. And you might be wondering, why do we have 50% femoral edge coverage on ultrasound? And they thought the hip was frankly dislocated. And I will give you some examples of that. So here is an example of a child that's referred to us, had um, an ultrasound done, and it showed roughly about 40% femoral edge coverage. Looks not that bad on ultrasound. And you see, this is pretty close to two months and 28 days, almost three months. An X-ray done at three months, exactly to the day, two days later, we thought, look, that, that hip felt really funny. So we need to, you know, we got this patient to come back and did an X-ray and you can see the hips look way different. I mean, that ultrasound, you must have thought, okay, I'll, I'll get them back in a week or two and see how they look. But this X-ray is not leaving your clinic without you coming up with a definitive plan. So, there are issues in terms of false positive and false negative rate with some of these metrics. And what that study tried to do was try and quantify where can you get the 95, 90% predictive value and roughly around 35. So we're also working on a three-dimensional ultrasound, much like what they do in obstetrics, that's they do actually do 4D ultrasounds. And as you can see in our preliminary research investigation, the variability when you use a 3D ultrasound is quite low, but this technique is not widely used. It's not widely popular, still a subject of investigation. Why do we need x-rays and when do we transition to x-rays? So personally for me, I'm able to transition to x-rays a little early between four to six months. And the earliest I've done in some of them to correlate if I thought that ultrasound looked really funny, even as young as three months. And we were able to do that because before, if you looked at it, most of our classification is based on tonus classification, which required your ospic nucleus to be appeared before you can use and figure out where that femoral uh, head is and what kind of dysplasia it is. And so that's how tonus described is grades, grade one, two, three, four, pretty self-explanatory looking at these pictures as to what would be a grade one. But as you can see here, you do need that ospic nucleus to apply. And uh, again, IHDI came up with this classification because they had some centers that were doing x-rays really early, two months, two and a half months, three months. And one of the criteria for entering a patient into the IHDI is pre-treatment, you should have had some imaging, whether it's a plain x-ray, or an ultrasound. And even though I'm an author, I can't take credit for actually coming up with this classification. I helped with the manuscript. And they came up with this classification where you could look at this midpoint of basically the metaphysis and try and look at where the, and guess where the femoral head might be by grading it into one, two, three, four, based on which quadrant it's going to be. As you can see, clearly the three and the four or dislocated hips, and one would argue the two is a subluxable hip or subluxated hip. This, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but I would tell you, this is the kind of correlation we need before we give a final diagnosis. And that is one of the highlights of uh, Woody's paper. You all always have to correlate your clinical finding with your radiological finding and come up and grade what that hip is. And that's what we do in the database. So you're looking at where their femoral head is, their joint laxity, and where x-ray is available, their IHDI grade. You're looking at their estabular morphology, and then you're coming up with a oral diagnosis, which takes into account clinical and radiological, whether it is an x-ray or an ultrasound. Really, if you want to compare results of each center, want to compare results of one surgeon to another, one technique to another, this is really the kind of detail we need in our publication so that we could really compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges.
Here is an example of a child that had an ultrasound done, done quite early. As I said, sometimes we can see hips that are quite immature. And this patient was seen because the family doctor thought that at birth, the hip was dislocated. And at exam, the doctor at the time thought that, okay, I would get an ultrasound done and decided to leave that hip because it does qualify in the mild dysplasia range. So decided to leave that. And this patient comes back at three weeks and the hip starts to look a little worse. And at five weeks, you can see the coverage is a lot less and clinically too, now this hip is dislocated but reducible. And uh, the, hip, the patient was treated in a brace and the hip started to improve. And then you can see on this X-ray that even though the ultrasound looked as good as it looked there and the beta angle is quite low. So you're thinking, well, the hip is probably gonna develop quite nicely. Or this was a normal patient with risk factors, but if ultrasound always looked good, you do follow up with another X-ray because of this. You can see this X-ray roughly at six months of age showing a dysplastic hip on your plain X-ray on the left side. Whether to treat this or not is a controversial topic, but what follow-up is required is also a controversial topic. But personally for me, um, I may or may not treat this hip after talking to the family, but I would for sure follow this hip along with another radiograph at least four to six months later. And this is the child that was left without any treatment, but followed. And you can see this hip went on to develop into a normal looking hip. And how do we look at these x-rays? Those of us that are not used to seeing ultrasounds. And one of the things that we got when Al led the survey for POSI of pediatric orthopedic surgeons in India, one of the most concerning thing that people had was they had access to ultrasound, but they were not very confident about the reports they got from the ultrasound. So people wanted a little more information about how they would interpret once the X-ray ultrasounds are done. And I would simply say, we're used to looking at plain X-rays. So just try to orient yourself and make those ultrasound vertical. So that gives you a kind of information about where the femoral head is, how much, the, how much is the coverage and what the cartilage of that acetabulum is looking like and what the side of your ileum is gonna look like. So I simply, sometimes I tilt my head if I can't tilt the ultrasound image. Back in the day when they used to get films and I would tilt them up and look at them just like the way I look at plain radiographs. And what do we know in terms of screening? So I was fortunate to be involved with these guidelines development with Posner and with American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. There were 25 members from seven different societies uh, that were actually a part of this guideline development. But what came out was there's a huge evidence gaps in terms of some of the topics that we're gonna to discuss today. But in terms of the old risk factors that we knew about, uh, you have them as firstborn, female, breech, Caucasian, left hip. But the guidelines that came quite strongly in these recent guidelines are breech presentation, family history, and I'd like to draw upon this particular term of clinical instability, which means if you have a referral from one of your orthopedic colleagues or a pediatrician colleague that says, I was there at the delivery and I examined the child less than a week and I thought the SIP is unstable. So that correlated highly with a dysplastic hip down the road and the history of swaddling, which is tying those hips really tightly. And then going back to what does the evidence show about screening, including those guidelines to what's been done as a part of a Cochrane collaboration or a Cochrane review. Boston group did a really nice decision analysis, but the conclusions of all of them are exactly the same, which is in our current day with healthcare resources that are strapped, and also, as we can see with these kind of measures of social distancing, where we cannot be doing every single child, can't afford to do an ultrasound, it's probably most cost efficient to do a universal clinical exam with a selective ultrasound screening with the risk factors that I mentioned before. 
and that's what we do in BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, and that's what a lot of other centers do. And now, once you do this, right, typically you do a six week ultrasound. If you thought you had one of those risk factors, so you worried about it. And then you end up having a multiple different outcomes from that ultrasound. You could have a hip that's frankly dislocated, which I don't think there is any controversy. Most people would say what well, I would treat that. Severe dysplasia, most people would agree that I would treat that. Those I was talking about, either graph 2C on, onwards. What do you do with mild dysplasia? This is where the most amount of controversy is. And what do you do with the bottle of positive hips? And personally for me, these two, I would just follow them up with another X-ray between four and six months of age. Why do we need to do that? And this retrospective study done from San Diego, they looked at all the breech babies and at ultrasound at six weeks, they found about roughly 27% of them had abnormal ultrasound. But to be honest, that's not replicated by our study in Vancouver, which is unpublished. Our numbers are a lot lower than 30%. And then out of the ones that turned out to be normal, they had again roughly another 30% of them that showed dysplasia. So that shows you that that six weeks ultrasound is not end all and be all. You do need to follow these hips that are referred to you for risk factors, or if you thought the hip was unstable to start with, but stabilized by six weeks, you do need for the follow-up. And here is an example of a child. You can see that's three months and 11 days. That hip looks pretty good. This hip was dislocated to start with and, uh, and was treated. But again, as you follow these x-rays, you can see this x-ray done around the same time shows the degree of dysplasia that you see, right? So it's important to follow these. What is my approach? And I must admit that what you see as 12 months and 24 months right now is part of a research investigation. I am not recommending that we follow this up, but for sure we follow them up to six months with an X-ray. If that X-ray is normal, I think at that point in time, it's dealer's choice, but I do follow them a bit longer. Who do I personally treat? As I said, I do not treat mild dysplasia. This is again, highly controversial. I'm not suggesting all of you not to treat bottle positive hips, but I do not treat those hips. If the hip is in, I have to push the hip to go out. Uh, why would I want to use the brutal force and say, look, I think that hip now needs to be treated. So I personally won't treat them. This is again, a subjective investigation. We're writing a randomized control trial protocol to be able to study as a part of our registry. Dislocated hips that are reducible, reducible, there's no controversy. And we will discuss that in the next few minutes. So the typical treatment is brace, close reduction or hip spike or cast and surgery, which Dr. Shankar is going to discuss. What kind of brace? Again, I would say dealer's choice, but my preference is a pelvic hardness, which is readily available. There is also a controversy versus soft versus rigid brace, which I'll touch upon. There are some centers that would prefer a rigid brace to start with. Some would start with a soft brace and if that fails, they go on to a rigid brace. So how do you treat a dislocated reducible hip? I would start typically by putting them in a pelvic harness. And I tell the families that uh, I would use this for 24 hours. Now that I have a point of care ultrasound, I do an ultrasound at that time to see if the hip is in or out. Even if the hip is out, I wouldn't worry about it. I send the patient home. We teach them how to check for femoral nerve palsy. We also check for and see if we have x-ray available in the clinic, we would do a follow-up ultrasound when we see them in the clinic. Again, there are not all centers that do that, but where they're available, especially as if you're collecting them as a part of research, you do see what's going on with that hip. If the hip is stable, then I do change my follow-ups to once every two weeks, and we can let them come out for bathing purposes at that point in time. Six to eight weeks, I do an ultrasound, and if the ultrasound is normal, which is alpha angle is more than 60 degrees, and beta is less than 50, I typically discontinue the hardness at that point in time. And I do see them back at four months to get an x-ray. But if the hip is dysplastic, is in but dysplastic, I sometimes switch over to a rhino cruiser brace because it's easy to apply and easy to take out and a lot easier for families. So I do make a switch to the brace more for ease 
then I might believe that this is a better brace than a parallel cognitive. And I would, as I said, typically get x-rays of four to six months of age. If you look at, again, this prospective study from IHDI, what are the results? And the brace treatment is successful in 79%, but if you look at the results, there are some that talk about 90%, some it's as low as 65%. So it does depend on what paper you're reading, again, what degree of severity of dysplasia they're dealing with. And here's, we're only talking about dislocated but reducible hips. And the factors are associated with base failure, obviously severity of dislocation, age of treatment, the brace type, and the hip that's affected, the right hip is more resistant to treatment. Here's an example of a six month old that came with actually a dislocated hip. Mind you, these slides are not mine, my colleague, uh, Tony Coopers. So Tony decided to treat this child in a pavlic harness. And when he put this kid in a pavlic harness, he got an X-ray done and it showed the hip is actually reduced and he continued to follow this child. And this is typically what I would do. And people say, what follow-up x-rays do you get once you have a patient that you're treating either for a brace or a closed reduction? I typically get one x-ray in brace and one out of the brace. I wanna know if you take the brace out, is the hip still stable? Can it still stay in? That's my litmus test to know if I can get this brace to come out. The length of time I would leave somebody out of the brace. And at three of follow-up, you can see that hip is nicely developed. So some people treat brace as a first line of option, no matter at what age they see the child. It doesn't matter if they're at three months, four months, six months, they would treat a child. Here's an example of a dislocated irreducible hip. And uh, again, this is a patient of Tony Cooper's. He treated this child with a rhino cruiser brace. Apparently he was trying to do a randomized control trial, I'm kidding, but so this patient, he went with a rhino cruiser brace. And this patient uh, reduced quite nicely. And still, there is some residual dysplasia and this patient is being followed up as we speak. And what do you do if the pavlic fails? Personally for me, I will move on at that point in time to talking to parents about closed reduction slash open reduction. And again, controversy in terms of timing. I would typically do any time from two months on, I have an informed discussion in terms of at two months, doing only a closed reduction. If closed reduction fails, I'm gonna bring that child back in at four or five months for an open reduction. A lot of my colleagues would argue treating a child at two months may be slightly more anesthesia risk in terms of brain development down the road. And they would rather wait till four months of age to do close last open reduction all at the same point in time. I totally agree with their philosophy. And I talk to the patient family and decide about what they would like to do. But there are a lot of people, if a pavlic fails, they move on to rigid brace because they think this may work. And what evidence do we have? So there are some papers that are published in the past that mainly talked about a good success rate with that. But there is also a paper that talked about they might not have seen a huge benefit with using this brace. Again, all sorts of different braces was used. And there's a lot of Mind you, these are small series. Woody Shankar looked at it from CHOP and he had two groups that went straight to closed reduction and another group that went to a rigid, more of a rigid brace after Pavlik failed. And he looked at the success rate in terms of normalization of the hip, the HDI grades. Mind you, these groups are pretty comparable at baseline in terms of all the characters in terms of brace time, uh, Pavlik harness time prior to this treatment decision. And this is an example that he shared with me, mind you, these slides are his slides that he generously shared with me that shows that this is a failure of Pavlik at four weeks of age. And the patient was then initiated onto this l felt orthosis. And at the end of bracing, that hip looked pretty normal. And this is how the l felt brace looks like. They had a pretty good success rate. They had about 82% success rate with the brace, which is quite high, but mind you, I don't use this brace. My rigid brace I, I switched on to in few cases is a Rhino Cruiser brace. I did not have a huge success with this approach, but there are people that have successfully shown that. The other controversial topic is why do we stop public honor? Why can't we go on three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks? Because this public honor's disease was described. 
a lot of the time when we describe to coin a word or a particular problem, I often joke with my residents say, if I drink too much wine on the night before I wake up on the left side of the bed, I come up with a term because Kisho Mulpuri came up with it for a number of years, people will talk about that. So public they say, why do we stop at two or three weeks? There is no hard evidence that things morphologically change irreversibly at this point in time. Again, our own smart Dr. Shankar tried to look at in their hips where patients were left in the brace and patients were followed up much longer. And he did not show a big changes that we talk about in those hips, but that again needs to be studied in a larger cohort of patients more prospectively. What do we do with dislocated reducible hips? Treatment is pretty similar to the reducible hip, but the success rate is lower. The chance of femoral nerve palsy is a little bit higher. Here is a paper that looked at what is the success rate for dislocated irreducible rate. Remember we talked about for reducible hips it was roughly about 79%, but here the success rate is about 59%. Still, it's a sensible first line of management as opposed to what we think, oh, this is the irreducible hip, so I'm gonna leave it alone. I would urge you to consider start treatment. And if it fails, then it's dealer's choice. Do you wanna go on to a more rigid brace or do you wanna go on to a close reduction at a later date? What about this complication femoral nerve palsy? Again, we looked at that as a part of uh, this prospective study. And we also compared with this paper that's published from Texas Scottish Rite. And our results showed that our rate is about 5.9% of the patients that were treated that are dislocated and reducible and irreducible hip, but disproportionately high number happened to be from irreducible hips. You can see 12% in the dislocated irreducible hips, right? So when you put a dislocated reducible hip, you need to watch out for that complication. And this is where I would say your treatment preference comes into what you do because we are a prospective multi-center study. Everybody treated differently. When I see a femoral palsy, I rarely put them back in a brace again. I bring them back about two weeks. I put them back in a brace. And if the femoral nerve palsy comes back again, I stop the brace. So in my practice, a large number of femoral nerve palsies have gone on to close reductions. But in some others, they continued on brace, they went with a different kind of a brace and they've had a better success rate. So basically what that tells you is it's quite variable. What do you do if you do see femoral nerve palsy? But I would say the sensible thing to do would be to stop the brace. But this needs to be again looked at much more broadly with time to really look at predictors. And this slide is sort of my kind of algorithm. If you wanna go back and look at later on about how I would manage someone from treatment of an abnormal hip to when I would discharge them from care. And why did I talk so much about my preference, my pre even though we've been running this study for six years, is this is what tells you when we did this survey of pediatric orthopedic surgeons of North America, there's a huge amount of variability. And this is exactly what Dr. L. Rouge has found when he surveyed Posey, you guys, about how you manage that displacement of the hip. The evidence summary of what we know prospectively so far is again in this Australian journal, medical journal for you to review. But hopefully this registry, which also has some centers from India, will give us some insights maybe in the next five to 10 years on some of these controversial topics. You can see here, we've got five centers from India that are contributing. And at presentation, we have huge variability between the two groups of what we're entering in the West to India, that not necessarily that the mean age in India is three years. There are some younger children that probably were not entered into the database because they didn't have a priori um, radiographs or ultrasound. But nonetheless, you all know that you see way more walking age dysplasia than we do in this part of the world. And Al is working on this collaboration with Posey and IAP is leading those efforts. And I commend him for taking that initiative and Posey for investing their time, for IAP to invest in their time. And our registry is gonna support the process much like this care pathway that was developed by the Stanford group. 
hopefully we'll be come up with some tools that uh, you can use. But there are a lot of resources in the International Dysplasia Institute. I have not gone into how do you apply public, how do you do these exams. They're all there, beautifully illustrated, beautiful videos on this website. And I would close my talk with one thing that my mentor taught me. In DDH, if in doubt, it's out. If it's out, either do further imaging, or if you're doing a closed reduction, go on to do an open reduction. So keep this in mind. If in doubt, it's out. Don't force any treatment. Watch carefully. And I'd like to acknowledge the funding that we received from multiple sources to, for us to be able to carry out this study that we're doing. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Kishore. That was, I think, a very, very comprehensive uh, outlook that you have uh, given us. Uh, I know there'll be a lot of questions from our panelists and from the audience as well. But uh, I think we should first listen to what Woody has to say before we move on to the question answer and the case discussion session. So uh, I turn over the mic to uh, Dr. Woodbur Sankar and Woody, the mic's all yours. Uh, perfect, can everybody hear me? Yes, that's great. Okay, all right, excellent. Well, first, uh, I just wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to uh, speak at this wonderful uh, webinar in front of this uh, great society. So again, it's really a, an absolute honor to be uh, here with the, with the other group presenting and, and have everybody interested in, in what I might have to say. So I'm gonna be talking about the surgical treatment of DDH under three years of age. Uh, as Kishore did, I'm gonna talk about kind of my own approach and then roll in some data where I think it, it makes sense. Um, so in terms of surgical indications, um, this is primarily for high-grade subluxations and dislocations that are not amenable to bracing. And that really means that they fall into one of two groups. Either they've already tried a, a brace or a harness and have failed that, or they present perhaps beyond about six to, month, six to eight months of age, at which point a brace is a little bit less effective. It certainly can be tried, as Kishore showed in those cases, but, but most people think that the efficacy becomes a little bit less and a little bit harder to tolerate for the infants as they get older. Regardless of what type of surgery you choose to do, the goals are always the same, which is to obtain a deep, concentric, and stable reduction, because this uh, optimizes your ability of the acetabulum to remodel and minimizes the risk of complications, most notably avascular necrosis. So there are two primary options at your disposal. There's closed reduction and spike of casting. Then there's open reductions, and these can be performed medial or anterior. And we'll talk about when uh, and if to do a pelvic osteotomy and a femoral osteotomy. So first, let's talk about timing of surgery. And Kishore mentioned this as well, and you'll see already there's some slight differences. I look at these as really two major scenarios. So the first is kind of the failed brace scenario. So these are the kids that have been in your practice from the beginning. You know about them, uh, and, and they're, you know what they are, you know they need to be treated. And when you choose to treat them, I think depends on several factors. One is your belief in the efficacy of a closed reduction, which we'll talk about how you perceive the risks of anesthesia are to a young infant, uh, and you heard some differences already about that. Um, what you think the relative importance of the ossific nucleus is, uh, which I think more and more is being discounted, uh, but some people still feel strongly about that. And then your comfort on performing open reductions on extremely small infants. My own personal preference, which is different as you already heard than Kishore's, is I, I take these patients to the operating room around seven to eight months of age. At our institution, we believe the anesthetic risk decreases after six months. Uh, and to me, that's the right uh, time in terms of size of child. And I always uh, uh, set patients up to go directly from a closed reduction to an open reduction under the same anesthetic. And then we can get all the casting done before the children start to walk. So that's my preference. Um, the second scenario is the older age situation. And, and I think there's very little controversy beyond 18 months. I think most people would say, you know, these patients can be scheduled for surgery as soon as is feasible with the family uh, and the surgeon. Um, when you have the younger kids, so below perhaps 10 to 11 months, I, I think of them similar to that failed brace scenario where I, I basically go as soon as they're beyond seven to eight months, uh, as I mentioned. I think where there's some controversy is the in-between age, so 11 to 18 months of age. I think there are kind of two schools of thought. One is to go early in these kids to try to maximize your acetabular remodeling potential. But the other school of thought is maybe you should wait until about 18 months of age uh, when the child perhaps is larger and you can perform a concomitant pelvic osteotomy because there may be a high rate of residual dysplasia if you just do the open reduction. And so I think there's these two kind of competing views that are becoming more prevalent, uh, at least in North America. My own preference is to go early if they're in 12 or 13 months. I find it hard to wait four to six months in a kid uh, uh, to put the hip in at that age. However, the closer they approach 18 months, uh, 
I'll just go ahead and schedule them and plan on doing a pelvis at that same time. And we'll talk more about that. So let's get back to closed reduction and spiky casting. So what are the indications in my mind? Uh, again, high-grade subluxations, dislocations, intermediate age group, six to 15 months of age. I think this procedure has gotten a lot of criticism recently by many of my own friends in North America. However, I think this uh, procedure still plays a very important role in the DDH armamentarium. I think uh, the people that criticize this say that uh, there's high rates of needing to go back later and do something on the pelvis, which we'll talk about more. But I think the key here is getting a high quality reduction. I think if you can get that femoral head nicely and deeply seated in the acetabulum and you can do that very nicely in a closed technique, I think there are some advantages. I believe as Dennis Wenger does, uh, that the infant hip is like a Swiss watch. It's this beautiful uh, working device. And if you don't have to open it up and mess with it, there may be some, some upsides to that. Uh, but again, the key is getting a high quality reduction. So in terms of technique, I take these patients to the ER, I assess their initial reducibility with a, you know, an, a typical Orlani maneuver to see if I feel it reduce. Uh, if it does, then I assess the stability uh, through the safe zone by how much abduction, adduction, internal rotation, et cetera, what finds that optimal position and how unstable the hip is. I then assess tension, and this is important because this uh, we think is a major risk factor for osteonecrosis, which has been reported to be anywhere from two to 36% after these procedures. Admittedly, this is very hard to quantify when you're teaching trainees and experience and feel play a major role. This is the art of uh, hip dysplasia treatment. Um, certainly you can uh, manage the tension to some extent by performing a tenotomy, either the longest or even uh, uh, the psoas. But I don't feel like tenotomies are a panacea. So I don't feel like you can push a hip that's very tight in and then try to do some tenotomies to get you safe. I think of tenotomies as an extra layer of protection for a hip that does gently basically reduce on its own. And this is where preoperative traction uh, could be helpful. I personally do not have any experience with this or very little experience with this in North America, but certainly this is used throughout the world, but some mixed results in the literature. But this is where this may play a role in to try to relax the soft tissues before taking the patient to the operating room. Uh, once you assume that, or once you assess that the hip does reduce and that the tension is not too bad, I think the most important thing is to assess the quality of the reduction. And this is where I think an arthrogram is absolutely crucial. There are some institutions, some peer institutions around the world that don't do arthrograms. I, I find this a really essential part of this. Uh, I think this is another one of those arts of, uh, of DDH treatment. To, I could look at hundreds of arthrograms and, and pick up something different from each one and, and feel like I learned something and no two hips are the same. There are some basic things that you want to think through as you go through this. You want to assess the medial dipole, which is essentially an assessment for how uh, medialized the hip is. So ideally, you see a thin rim of dye uh, there showing that the femoral head is having nice contact with the, uh, with the acetabular surface. Ideally, you see a nice chondrolabral complex with a, hopefully a sharp corner, but at least a pretty reasonable corner uh, and, and most of the femoral head lying underneath this structure. And the real question I ask myself when I uh, assess these arthrograms is, can I make this better with an open reduction? You know, there are a lot of these femoral heads that are aspherical, and so you'll see some differences in the dye. But I try to say, you know, can I make this better by opening the hip? So here's some arthrograms that I was less happy with. So uh, on the first one here is a, a very thick ligamentum teres causing lateralization of the femoral head. In the middle is an example of an infolded labrum that's creating some incongruency. And then uh, the last one is, uh, is uh, a large medial dipole, um, uh, which indicates that that femoral head is not as medialized as I'd like. So all of these in my mind would be, uh, would be unacceptable arthrograms. Oops, sorry. Um, so a few more slides about the importance of the quality of reduction. So uh, G in 2016 looked at 41 hips, mean fall up of 18 months. They looked at the uh, quality of the reduction based on post-operative MRI. And they found, not surprisingly, that the better reduced the hip, the better the tonus graded long-term follow-up, the lower the acetabular index, meaning less residual dysplasia, and less severe forms of osteonecrosis at follow-up. In the classic study by Race and Herring, they looked at 59 hips, combination of x-rays and arthrograms, and they said that the most important factor in outcome was the quality of the initial reduction. And they came up with this definition of a poor reduction is greater than a seven millimeter medial dipole. But admittedly, this is actually very hard to apply uh, intraoperatively to fluoroscopy when you can't measure so well. Forland in 1992 looked at 72 hips, mean of follow-up of five years. And they found that the higher medialization ratio on the arthrogram yielded better results in terms of the Severin outcome classification. And if there was an interposed limbus, this led to poor results and increased rates of osteonecrosis. So again, quality of reduction is absolutely key. 
So again, to drive home this point even more, well medialized hip, uh, um, chondrolabral complex covers the femoral head pretty well. That hip looks pretty good at several year follow-up. In contrast, infolded labrum, not a great reproduction, but this was accepted. And this is a hip that's subluxated and seems some fifth changes. So that's what you're trying to avoid. So assuming you have a nice reduction, a high quality reduction, the tension's adequate, um, uh, you go ahead and apply a spike of cast. I use a Gore-Tex liner to help with skin care. Uh, I use that arthrogram to help drive uh, the optimal position in the spike of cast. Uh, I use plaster to give us a nice mold. I spent a lot of time getting this upward trochanteric mold to hold the hip in place, and I include both legs in the spike of. I think it's important to get some form of advanced imaging to confirm that your hips are in three-dimensionally. There's lots of different options at your disposal. You can do CT scans, you can do intraoperative CT scans, which we call the O-arm. You can use an ultrasound, which is pretty uh, uh, readily available through the window in the cast. My own preference uh, these days is to do a perfusion MRI. Um, I think this offers some very detailed positional information after a closed reduction to look at any residual blocks to, to, to reduction. Helps correlate me with the arthrogram. Uh, I do use contrast, which gives you some perfusion information. I think more and more this is becoming a little bit murky as far as how predictive this data is, but I still do it. I think it gives me some information. I schedule these to be done within six hours uh, um, after the patient uh, as their spike cast placed on. We do this unsedated after the patient's extubated. The patients can't move too much in the spica, so we still can get detailed info. Uh, as I said, the interpretation is a little bit challenging. There's a lot of subjectivity to it. You have to look at a lot of these uh, to get a sense of this. But in general, I remove the cast if the hip is globally blacked out. Uh, and I tend to observe partial decreases in perfusion based on some of the Boston Children's data. So here's what you want to see, which is that uh, left hip reduced uh, and uh, some nice vascular channels. Here's an example of, of a focal decrease in perfusion with that stripe there. Uh, that's something I would observe. And then most concerning would be a complete blackout in the hip. And, and that's a hip that would concern me more and I would take that cast off. Uh, my personal post-op protocol after a closed reduction, assuming that the hip is in and, and I'm happy with the perfusion, I bring the patients back at three weeks for a non-contrast rapid protocol MR that only takes us about five to eight minutes at our institution. We do that unsedated. I offer them a cast change at six weeks, but I, more and more I'm trying to avoid second anesthetics in these infants is for the reasons Kishore mentioned about brain development. And so I go three months before taking it off and then convert to an abduction brace for nights and naps indefinitely, but for at least a year and a half to two years to facilitate remodeling and then regular follow-up with x-rays. Outcomes of closed reductions. So we have pretty reasonable prospective IGI data. We had 87 hips in this series, mean follow-up. Uh, a little less than two years, 91% of hips remain stable. You can see how that relates to others in the literature. A 25% rate of osteonecrosis. We used a pretty rigorous definition with multiple reviewers and consensus rating. So I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty good metric uh, in this particular study. Uh, mean has to have our index 25 degrees and rate of further corrective surgery 11%. And, and we'll talk about this in a second, but this is a, a little bit dicey when you look at this as an outcome measure because it's very subjective. So here are my opinions on closed reductions. As I mentioned, I, I think there's been this growing movement away from this procedure. In my opinion, I think redislocations and avascular necrosis are a clear failure of treatment. Nobody would be happy with that. But in my opinion, residual acetabular dysplasia is not necessarily a failure of closed reduction. I think if you look at the, the reports uh, that uh, condemn closed reductions, they often use further corrective surgery as an outcome marker. And this is really subjective. So it depends on the surgeon decision-making to decide whether or not to intervene. And Kishore has showed us in, in uh, one of his IGI studies uh, that this is notoriously unreliable. So in my own opinion, and if this was my family and those are my three kids, um, I would take a high quality closed reduction over the potential risks of opening a hip and creating stiffness and scarring and that Swiss watch analogy that Dennis Wenger talked about. And that's even if I have to come back later several years down the road and do a subsequent extra articular osteotomy. Again, this is my opinion. So if I never have to open the joint and I have to do an extra articular osteotomy down the road, to me, I think there are some upsides to that. But again, I recognize that that's not everybody's opinion. All right, so when do you go open? Well, the obvious answer is when you can't get a good close reduction. Uh, we have some data showing that open reductions become more likely if you have a graph four hip on that initial ultrasound. If you have an IGI grade four hip, which is that bottom right, so a higher uh, dislocation and a negative or line sign, meaning that the hip is uh, clinically irreducible uh, in the outpatient setting. The other uh, relative indication for an open reduction is increasing age, so perhaps beyond 18 months. 
when you start uh, uh, thinking that the, there may be diminished uh, remodeling potential in the pelvis and you're going to be there doing an open procedure anyway, and you may say, you know, I want to be absolutely sure the hip is well reduced. And then you can do these medial or anterior. So the medial open reduction, there's lots of different techniques that have been uh, described, but uh, the most common used in North America, at least, is the Stu Weinstein modified Ludloff approach done through a medial adductor incision. The interval is between the pectineus and the neurovascular bundle. This creates kind of two windows around the medial femoral circumflex artery. The distal window can be used to access the psoas, which you release off the trochanter. The proximal window is used to access the medial capsule. You open this, you come right down on the, on the TAL and the ligament anterior, which you can excise or you can reserve for potentially repairing. I tell my fellows and residents that the medial open reduction is really an augmented closed reduction. You're clearing out the, the impediments, but you're not doing anything to hold it in. So you're still relying on the spica. So that's, uh, that's why I use a similar technique to a closed reduction. So I use a three month uh, spica with the hip and more flexion, just like I would with the closed reduction technique. I still get advanced imaging, but I do it slightly differently after a medial open reduction. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. So I tend to uh, get CT scans more. I, I actually personally use the O-arm, which I can do intraoperatively. I do that because I've opened the hip and I do not want to leave the operating room unless that hip is in. So this allows me immediate decision-making. If the hip is out, I can either readjust the spica or reopen the hip. Um, again, MRIs have their uh, upsides. Um, uh, there's no radiation. Uh, it gives you more information about persistent soft tissue blocks. But to me, the perfusion data is, is far less helpful because I've already harmed the hip with an incision and I can't necessarily undo what I've just done just by taking the cast off. So I almost don't want to know what the perfusion info is at that point. And it also requires me leaving the operating room, which, as I said, I prefer not to do after I've done an open surgery. So advantages of medial open reduction, great visualization, the medial side of the joint, especially the TAL. It's minimally invasive. These are extraordinarily cosmetic incisions uh, that almost completely disappear. It spares the ilium and the abductors, which I think is important for these kids who often need surgeries later in life. Disadvantages, you can't do a capsulography, uh, which may be necessary in certain cases. You cannot perform a pelvic osteotomy through the uh, same incision. Uh, and I find this harder to manage soft tissue tension uh, so for me, it's harder to extend that capsulotomy far underneath the neurovascular bundle. So it's hard for me to go get a very high hip. Uh, and so I get a little bit nervous about uh, managing tension in that situation through this approach. In terms of outcomes, Gardner wrote a nice systematic review in 2014 uh, out of um, uh, SickKid, 734 hips, mean fall up 10.9 years. The AVN rates you see there that increase with age. Uh, low redislocation rates, and again, further corrective surgery is 26%, but as I mentioned to you already, that's a fairly unreliable metric. So my personal indications for a medial open reduction are younger infants are below perhaps 12 months of age. I'd like to do them when I try a closed reduction and I feel the head 